You notice in the Buddha's instructions on breath meditation, there are 16 steps. And in the first two, you simply discern long breathing and short breathing. And from that, you can extrapolate fast, heavy, slow, deep, all different kinds of breathing. Get a sense of what the different kinds of breathing can do for you. The remaining steps, though, the Buddha said, are trainings. You train in how to breathe aware of the whole body. You train in how to breathe calming bodily fabrication, which basically means calming the breath itself. And as a couple of just say, you get to the point where the breath stops. That's when it's really calm. Same with training in feelings, mind states, mental qualities. So when you come here, you're submitting to a training. We often translate those passages as you train yourself to do these things. And you do have play a big role in your own training. But also know that there are standards that you're trying to live up to. Now, some of us have problems with that, living up to standards. We've been subject to all kinds of harsh and unhelpful standards being imposed on us. But you have to remember these standards come not because the Buddha just made them up. They're part of the duties of the Four Noble Truths. Again, they're duties of the Buddha to make up. If, if you want to put it into suffering, this is what you've got to do. And these duties, these shoulds, are all designed for your true happiness. You always have to keep that in mind. We're aiming at a happiness that's totally enveloping, total all around. And so that should give you a sense of joy as you practice. It's one of the reasons why John Fuhr would always say, play with the meditation. So he didn't mean playing in a desultory way, it's just doing whatever you want. He said, play to win. That requires a certain amount of dedication. But the dedication is fueled by your sense of enjoyment. On one hand, you may enjoy different ways of breathing. You may enjoy getting to know your own mind as you focus on the breath. And there's a sense of satisfaction that comes when you know that you've mastered a skill. Take joy in that as well. Remember what the Buddha said to Rahula. You reflect on your actions, your thoughts, your words, your deeds. And if you do something that doesn't harm anybody, doesn't harm you, doesn't harm other people, take joy in that fact. Learn how to remind yourself that this is a good accomplishment. Because for so many of our lives, we've been looking for happiness in an irresponsible way, not really caring about the consequences. I mean, you see simple things like the hummingbirds out there. They're really sloppy eaters. You put up a nice, clean hummingbird feeder, and by the time it's ready to be refilled, it's got sugar syrup all over it, and it's got their piss all over it. And that's the way most people go about their happiness. They take what they want without any thought about the consequences. And here you're thinking about the consequences, so take joy in that. See it as a game, the game you want to win. A while back I was talking to a professional athlete I gave him a copy of the book, Basis for Success, on the Itibata. He looked at the title and he said, well, the basis for success is working your ass off. And I said, well, yes, that is one of them, persistence. But they also admitted that it that wasn't all. You don't just put in a lot of effort. You want to be observant. And you take pleasure in being observant, because you're going to learn from it. And afterwards, I thought you could take all four of the Adipadas and you can express them in sports language. Desire. You have to want to win. Persistence. You have to work your ass off. Intent. Lock in. In other words, really focus on what you're doing. 
Wei Meng Sa, use your brains. Was that John Fuhr would say? Be observant and use your powers of ingenuity. You're going to hit the ball many, many times. Well, notice when you hit it right, what was the difference? See if you can recreate that. Well, the same principle applies here at the end of each meditation. Take a little time to think. When did the mind settle down really well? What was the best spot during the hour's meditation? Where were you focused? What was the breath like? What had you been doing leading up to that? If you're really mindful, you should be able to remember. You take what you can observe, however well you've observed your mind, and then you try to apply that knowledge next time around. See if it still works. And again, you're taking this as a game. If it doesn't work the next time around, it doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means that Maybe the mind is more complex than you thought. Maybe there's more going on than you thought. So you take it as a challenge. It's a friendly challenge, because these are friendly duties. This is a friendly game. The only losers in here are your defilements. So this is a game that should be entertaining. If you get grim about it, it's hard to take. One of the things I noticed about all the, the giants in Thailand is they all had really good senses of humor. Even some of the giants who were known to be fierce really had good senses of humor. There's a story that John Fuhr tells about a John Munn. When John Fuhr went to stay with him, he was still young. And there was a nun's community down the road where the monks would go passed on their arms round. And there was one of the nuns who took a liking to Jean Fuang. She started knitting little things for his spoons, fixing special central Thai food for him. And Jean Mun noticed this. The first thing he wanted to look at was Jean Fuang's reaction, and Jean Fuang wasn't interested. So then Jean Mun decided to help the nun. So one day the nuns came for their regular instructions from him. He started out asking if they were all observing the precepts, following the pattern of the old instructions that used to be given to bhikkhunis. And then he told them a story about Lady Wisaka, seeing lots of different groups of people observing the precepts. So she wanted to see why they were doing it. She asked some old people why they were observing the precepts, and they said they wanted to go to heaven after they died. And then she went from group to group, finally got to a group of young women, asked them why they were observing the Eight Precepts. They said, we want something better than heaven. We want a husband. That was the end of the special spoons and the special dishes for John Fu. So even a John Munn had a good sense of humor, because you need a sense of humor when you're dealing with your defilements. If you can't laugh at your greed, aversion, illusion, delusion, can't laugh at your lust, it's going to be a grim battle. But if you can laugh, you can basically step back. That's what discernment is all about, stepping back. I mentioned this the other day, when the issue of metacognition. You watch the mind thinking. You watch the mind as it focuses. You watch the mind as it's doing these things. It requires it certain distance. You're not totally invested in them, totally immersed in them. There will come times in concentration practice when you do get totally immersed. That's basically to give the mind a chance to rest and get still. And the ones that's been still, then when things start moving again, you can see them very clearly. But the discernment part is stepping back. It's one of the reasons why in that image for the, the cow, where you have a dead cow, and a butcher takes a knife and cuts all the different tendons that connect the skin to the cow, and then puts the skin back on. And it's a skin attached to the cow as it was before. Well, no. It's an image for the awakened mind. It's not a pretty image, but it's very effective. 
the skin stands for the outside sense spheres. The cow's body stands for the inside, and there's a sense of disjointment, separation. It's through the knife of discernment these things got separated. Or as the Buddha said elsewhere, discernment is what sees things as separate, sees things as other. You step back from them. And having a sense of humor is one really good way of stepping back from things. So it's important that you learn how to enjoy the meditation as you're really doing it well, because you are trying to hold yourself to high standards. But you want to do it in such a way that you're not beating yourself up. So look to where you find the enjoyment in the meditation, but also look to where you can discipline yourself more, train yourself to have some sense of discipline. Remember, we're here to live up to some standards, not just to invent the Dharma as we like it, or redo the Dharma as we like it. The basic principle is you practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. It's for the sake of dispassion. An important element of dispassion is learning to outgrow your old attitudes, i.e. the attitudes you have now. So it's a big job, but the important part of learning how to do a big job is one, breaking it down into little jobs, and then two, having a sense of lightness, a sense of enjoyment. As you see that you can begin to do things you weren't able to do before, you understand things you didn't understand before. Which requires there will be times when you have to work your ass off, lock in, use your brains. It's all because you really want to win. It is a battle, but the best battles are the ones where you develop all the skills you need. You're confident that you're going to come out victorious. <laughs>